understanding is we're live right now. Yes, sir. So, I wanted for Brian to come up here and entertain you all. But missed his opportunity. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and God bless you, and welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Welcome to all of you who are joining us online as well. We are here today to give thanks to the Lord, to give praises to the Lord, to worship the Lord. And that's, that's what we're here to do. That's all that we're here to do. And you who love the Lord, let us praise Him. Amen? Amen. Stand up together with me, would you please? Stand up. We're going to sing our first song, and then we'll have our opening prayer after we sing. You're at home. Sing along with us, okay? Here we go. Sing our first song. Hallelujah. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. that we rejoice in isn't one that we conjure up on ourselves. We don't have it. The righteousness of you is imputed to those who believe and that's, that's the truth of your word all the way from the beginning, Lord God. As, as far back as Abraham, 
long before there was even in Israel. As far back as Abraham, we read in the word that he believed God and was credited with righteousness. So the righteous one who rejoices before you is the one who has been credited with it by you because they believe in you. We earnestly desire to walk in righteousness and we stumble and fall and stumble and fall and stumble and fall. And that's why we and the rest of the world find ourselves alienated from you. But you did this wonderful thing to bring us near. You, Lord God, in great love for the unrighteous, gave the righteous one, your Son, our dear Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, as he told Abraham, this, the, your own spoke of how he gave his Son, his only Son. Well, you gave your only Son. And then your voice came from heaven on the day that Jesus was baptized and said, this is my Son whom I love. You gave Jesus the righteous one who, in his righteousness, took the penalty for our unrighteousness, that we might become the righteousness of you through him, through faith, by your grace. It's a lot of words, but Lord, it's not just words, it's reality. We can stand here and sing and rejoice because of what you've done. Your love, your mercy, your compassion, your desire to redeem sinners. You rejoice when you redeem sinners. You gather to yourself sinful people and cleanse them when they believe. We go on day to day, we still battle and struggle. You tell us, you tell us even that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It goes on and on and on and nothing can separate us from your love. And you have sealed it and made it permanent, irrevocable, guaranteed salvation by you yourself, the Holy Spirit, coming into us. And we rejoice. And we pray that you'd fill us with your spirit and help us, Lord God, in all humility and in all contrition and in all brokenness, Lord God, that you'd fill us with your spirit now to worship you and to praise you. And we pray that everything that happens in this assembly today would exalt, lift up, honor, glorify, the name of Jesus, the only name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Who's, who's, who here is saved by grace? Clap your hands. Clap your hands if you're saved by grace. You know what grace is, right? Among, among the many things you can say about grace is it's, it's something that you did nothing to contribute to. Could, could never, still can't. You can't add anything to it. It's just that goodness that manifests itself in Christ's sacrifice that emanates from God, who is good. It comes entirely from Him. That's what saves you, that's what sustains you and keeps you and will deliver you in the end. Yeah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like Thank you. 
Concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which, it, which was created according to God in yes. true righteousness yes. and holiness. Therefore, put away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who is in need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Heavens 
the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lord and heaven and earth. The earth is the Lord's, the heavens, the heavens are the Lord's, all the fullness thereof. Everything is God, made by Him and for Him. Hallelujah. Let's continue to sing. Let's take our hymnals out. Fanny's going to come up. I have my singers come up and help as well. Not my singers. You guys, come up here. Uh, turn to number 72, please. actually a song that I remember back from my early days as a believer. Like, uh, yeah, that's an old Twyla Paris song. Yeah, that's nice. Praise God. Praise God. Can we pray together? Shall we pray together? Let's bow before the Lord and let us pray. Lord Yahweh, you reign in majesty and we sit here together today and we bow before your throne. Hallelujah. 
You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. Simply from the infinite store of wisdom that is in your mind, by wisdom you founded the heavens and the earth. Everything that man has learned and way, way more than that, all exists and functions because it started in your mind and then emanated and came forth, sprang forth from nothing by your word. You spoke and things came into existence. You are Yahweh, the only God, the true God. We approach you the only way that a, a human can. The only way anyone in your creation can approach you is through the Lord Jesus Christ, your son. You have made a way, and that way is narrow. But you are the way, the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to you, Almighty Father, except through your only begotten Son, the Messiah, your anointed one, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, you made it possible that we could approach Almighty Yahweh, your Father. You made it possible that we could approach by your death. Because when you died, we know that it was the Father's will that you received. Through your blood, you are the propitiation for our sins. You received the judgment and justice and wrath against our sins when you died. You were buried, and on the third day you rose from the dead. So you have fulfilled the law. You have defeated all the power of Satan and sin and evil and wickedness. And you have conquered even death itself in your resurrection. And by grace alone, by grace alone, the gift is offered to all who trust in you. And you, you call all men to humble themselves. You call men and women everywhere to be broken and contrite before you and understand their sinfulness. Yes, Lord. And then in that humility and brokenness and repentance, you lead us. You lead us to salvation. Right. You lead us to the fountain of waters that never goes dry. You lead us to the waters that when we drink, we never thirst again. Praise your holy name. You are God, our Father. You are God, the Messiah, the Word which became flesh, the Son of God. And you are God, the Holy Spirit. And you live in us. And you call, call us to be filled and not to grieve or quench. Forgive us. And we know you do forgive us and we're, we rejoice in that. You're faithful to us. Forgive us, Lord, for our grieving of your Spirit. Fill us with your spirit that we might be led by your spirit that our walk, our walk that Deacon Bob read about a minute ago, that our walk, Lord God, might be worthy of you, of that calling, that calling that we could never fulfill in our own selves, in our own strength, that calling that is a calling of grace, a calling of sufficient grace, abounding grace, sustaining grace redeeming grace. Hallelujah. The kingdoms of the world are coming to nothing. Help us to be good citizens while we're here and to be respectful of the authority that you have called and to walk according to all of the statutes of the world that we're called to and to be good citizens and love our neighbors. Do good even to those who persecute us. Yes. However, let your kingdom come. Yes. As we just sang of the King of kings and Lord of lords, that's you. Yes. Come, Lord Jesus. Yes. Come, Lord Jesus. Yes. Come and fill and rule the earth which belongs to you. Yes. The heavens are yours. The earth is yours. Everyone who dwells in it is yours. Yes. You are the Lord of all. Come, Lord Jesus. In us, in my life, in my mind, in my heart, in my words, in my deeds, in how I relate to others, in the ministry of this church, and in the ministry of every church, among the people of the world who need to be saved and hear the gospel, let your will be done. Yes, 
Let your will be done. Lead us. Guide us. Speak through us. Reach out through us. Fill us. That our actions, which always fall short, but, but may our actions, Lord God, be the actions of you through us. Thank you for your provision in our lives. Thank you you provide us food, clothing, shelter. Every good thing we have from you is a blessing from you, from you, comes down from the Father of lights. Early in the morning I will celebrate the light. When I stumble in the darkness, we call your name, Lord, by night. Every good thing we have comes down from you and you add no sorrow to it. Thank you. Is it possible that one who has tolerated, I guess, one who has been forbearing and faithful and gracious and long-suffering with us, also beyond all of that, still works in our lives and blesses and provides and gives? It's true, and we know it, and you show it, and we love you because you love us so much. Lord, help us. Help us with our material possessions, and help us with our time, and help us with all of our energy to think of others and be a blessing to others around us. As your word says, love hopes all things, believes all things, bears with all things. Help us to love one another and love the world around us, the people around us. Share the gospel with them and be the agents of your gospel of grace to this world. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our apathy. Forgive us of our carnality and worldliness. Forgive us, we pray, Lord, of any evil speaking, of any evil thoughts. Forgive us of any evil actions and cleanse us from our sins. And help us to walk faithfully before you. And as we walk and live, please steer us away from temptation and protect us from the schemes and wickedness of the evil one who sows discord, the divider of the brethren, the accuser of the brethren. Keep us from his schemes. Help us to take up the shield of faith with which we will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You are the king and the real kingdom, the coming kingdom, the eternal kingdom is yours. All true power is from you, belongs to you, exists only because you let it. And certainly for anything good that goes on and for anything that exists, for anything that can be rejoiced in, anything that can be rejoiced in, all the glory belongs to you. Help us to walk according to these words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, praise the Lord. Let me give you a couple of announcements. Uh, After church, uh, after church today, today is Brother Carlos Loriano's birthday. And it's one of them... Come on, smile, brother. It happens to all of us, brother. Been there, done that. It's the, it's the big 5-0 for Brother Carlos today. Hey, hey, hey. Hallelujah. He's just a baby. Look at him. Look, look at him sitting back there with his two sisters, right? There you go. Look at us. So guess what? We're going to go downstairs after church and sing happy birthday to him down there and cut a cake, have a little fellowship after church. All right? Good? Everyone? I mean, if you, don't, you can't say no because it's already done. But yeah, yeah. All right. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. All right. Now, uh, then tonight, youth group at 6 o'clock, I'll be sending out the uh, confirming text and Lord willing, we'll have enough of you gathered together so we can do that. 6 o'clock tonight here. Uh, tomorrow, is the trunk or treat. You can clap for that. I'm making you. 
I'm wielding, I'm, I'm wielding my authority and making you clap. Because that's something you should, that's something you should be excited about. Because as I've been saying, uh, what's the interest in that for us? Well, yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah, it's a good way to interact with neighbors. But we get to give out gospel literature to people walking right in the neighborhood. So if you're coming to that, what time? Five? Uh, Earlier? It starts at five. So if you're involved... Come as early as four, I guess, if you want, right? Yeah. And so we'll be set up, and as people start going through the neighborhood, and I don't know how long it goes, till dark, I guess, or till little, the till the kids stop. That, that, well, there you go. That's why he's Deacon Bob. He just makes so much sense. We'll start when there's people walking around, and we'll stop when there aren't anymore. There you go. All right. Okay, so, but yeah, really, come at four o'clock tomorrow and pray about it. Pray about it. it's not just it's not just for kicks and for fun. It's 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 to give out literature and talk to people and have a chance to share the gospel. That's tomorrow. Uh, let's see. Tuesday night, the prayer time online. Sorry, the Facebook had outages this past week. That's we were there. We some of us were downstairs praying and we turned the camera on, but it didn't work. So uh, sorry about that. Hopefully that'll be back though. Tuesday night, nine o'clock, Bible study, Thursday night, seven o'clock. Uh, let's see. Um, today's, it's still October, right? So the men's fellowship is not this coming Saturday, right, Charlie? It's the following Saturday. All right, good. Now, a couple other things, though. There is, it is almost, Tuesday will be the beginning of November. Can you believe that? Yeah. So, so uh, November is Thanksgiving month, and our church dinner is three weeks from today. The church's Thanksgiving dinner is three weeks from today. There's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board in the foyer. There's, a, there's places there where there are kind of some pre-recommended things that you can sign up, put your name next to, that you can bring, turkey, ham, side dishes, all specific things laid out. And there's also some lines where you can pencil in some other things. That's very, very helpful to have some sort of idea of what's coming to the dinner so we can manage things well, all right? So please, start today. Start today and signing up and set it aside on your calendar and invite some people to come. That's one where we want visitors to come. We eat, we come upstairs, we sing, we share the gospel. It's a good fellowship and evangelistic opportunity. Then, uh, also the, I was given a piece of paper before the service and here, here it is. So we're doing Operation Christmas Child again. Hallelujah. Yeah. If you don't know what that is, because it's been a few years, there's like a list of things that you, ga you gather and you put them like in a shoe box and, and, and you, you bring it in and uh, it gets all um, collected. The date by which it's all due is uh, November, November 18th, which is two days before our dinner. It's the Friday before our dinner. It's all due that day, and then it all gets collected, and it goes with the missions organization Samaritan's Purse uh, uh, to be delivered and blesses people, children all over the world. And we've done this years past, but we're doing it again. It's open to anybody in the church. If you have any questions, you ask Rachel, all right? Rachel is our coordinator for all this this year. Praise the Lord. So if you have any questions about that, that's what's involved. But we encourage you to participate in that. So there you go. Between, the, between, between Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, we, we covered them all. There's all outreach opportunities connected with all of that. All it's waiting for is you to say, yes, I'm going to do it. Amen. And then go out and do it. And you can be involved in the spread of the gospel and have some joy and some fellowship for yourself as well, okay? All right, by way of announcements, deacons, have I missed anything? Have I missed anything? I don't think so. So how about Sunday school? Let's have a Sunday school pair. Come on up. Praise the Lord. Deacon Chris, Deacon Chris is going to lead us in prayer for our Sunday school folks. You all be happy to know that Deacon Chris changed the battery on the clock. Hallelujah. There we go. Hallelujah. I will try. But what it means is, if we get out late, we know in advance that we're getting out late. That's what it really means. Okay. Uh, it, it's a, uh, not the right time for you. It's not? Uh, 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.43. 10.
Father God, look after these children, Lord. Open their minds today, Lord. Let them hear your word. Uh, let it grow in their hearts, Lord. And let it become the foundation of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you all turn with me, please, to Acts chapter 27. Pray with me, please. Our Father, now we come to the time of our worship here together where we read from your word. We want to study your word. And Lord God, we pray that you would guide us and teach us and help us, Lord, as we study and learn that you would speak to us and, and encourage us and rebuke us, train us, build us up. Your, your word is profitable for all of that. Help us to become mature. We're always maturing. Help us to go on to completion, Lord. We know we don't achieve perfection. Even Paul said he hadn't attained that in this life, but in a way that's comforting to know. But, but Lord, help us to grow. Thank you that you bear with us in our weaknesses and you call us to bear with each other because you bear with us. But teach us through your word, we pray, Lord God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> okay. So, now let me just preface today's message by saying to you that uh, the, the passage of scripture that I'm reading from is one that is exceptionally narrative in nature. That is to say, uh, it's a story. And... It doesn't itself, on the surface reading of it, appear to be really theological or doctrinal at all. But, and so as we go through it, I'm going to kind of quickly read through it and make some points as we read through it. But then there are a couple of little incidents in this lengthy account that point us to... uh, items of teaching, different things that we can learn from. So if you understand what I mean, we're not going to camp out so much on this passage as we're going to let it launch us into a few other points, okay? Sometimes the book of Acts is like that, and this is certainly one of those times. I, I actually, 17 years ago, going through the book of Acts, which is the last time I did it, I actually treated chapter 27 and 28 as one message. And... Uh, It ended up being pretty good back then, but not quite going to do that today. But just so you know, that's where we're at. So I'm going to read all of chapter 27, pausing as I go through to to make some points. And then next week we'll get into chapter 28, which will probably take at least two weeks to get done. And then we'll be done with that. So here we are. Where do we leave off? The meeting with uh, Festus and Agrippa. And... They reached the conclusion that Paul hadn't done anything wrong and the only thing that prevented them, well, the only thing from man's perspective that prevented them from letting him go was that he had appealed to Caesar and that that utterance was irrevocable for the Romans. And so to Caesar he was going to go, as it says at the end of the uh, chapter there previously. He's going to go. 
Uh, we, of course, know that that's not just a item of minutia of Roman law. The Lord Jesus had already told Paul that this was going to happen. So Paul, it's a little example of how Paul while he's going through the hardships and the struggles, which are never pleasant to go through, Paul already knows the finish line, right? And so Paul, while he's wondering, am I going to live or am I going to die? He knows he's not going to die yet. He knows he's going to die someday. But he already knows he's going to go to Rome and he's going to testify there because the Lord Jesus told him that. And so while he endures all the hardships and all the struggles, he knows where it's headed, in a sense, that's kind of true for every Christian, isn't it? Our lives are full of hardships and difficulties and struggles, and we fail, and we pick ourselves up, and we, we, we well, the Lord picks us up. As Scripture says, the Lord, lift, we humble ourselves, and we actually lay ourselves down, and the Lord lifts us up, right? And in that, in that uh, uh, act of like going through life, we find ourselves in circumstances that can be unpleasant and difficult to bear while we're in the middle of them, but we know the end, and the end is in God's hands, and the end is already your possession, and the end is already something that's assured. Just like Paul knew he was going to end up at Rome, you know you're going to end up with the Lord forever if you're in Christ. We endure the hardships now because we know the blessing of the end. Anyway, then it says this in chapter 27. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy... They delivered, we, by the way, is, is Luke is writing this, and uh, so Luke includes himself along with Paul and a couple of other people. You'll see some names in a minute. Uh, when we decided to sail to Italy, it was decided that we should sail to Italy. They delivered Paul and some other prisoners to one named Julius, a centurion of the Augustan Regiment, and the Augustan Regiment would be a reference to uh, Augustus was one of the first Caesars, and his name, Augustus, had by this time, the time of Nero, become uh, a title for the Caesars, as Caesar itself became a title. So the Augustan Regiment means this is a soldier that is of a detachment that reports directly to the emperor. Julius is a centurion of the Augustan Regiment. So entering a ship of Adramitium, we put to sea, meaning to sail along the coasts of Asia, which would be modern-day Turkey, in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, going up towards the uh, Adriatic Sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, a town, Macedonia, and the city of Thessalonica being northwest of where they were, uh, sitting on the Ad uh, Adriatic Sea. Um, of the Aegean Sea, the Aegean Sea, I'm sorry, um, was with us. So you have Aristarchus with them as well, whose name comes up in some of Paul's writings. Not an issue for today. And the next day we landed at Sidon, which is on the Mediterranean coast north of, north of Caesarea. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him liberty to go to his friends and receive care. Uh, that's the favor of God in his life. As when he was a prisoner, he was in Caesarea, he was allowed to receive people. Well, Julius can see, Julius knows, no doubt, at least through Portius Festus, that Paul isn't really any threat. He hasn't done anything wrong. And so the favor of God is that Julius gives Paul this opportunity to go to his friends and to receive care and as a result, Paul gets to continue to minister all along the way. We're not given many details about that other than to know that Paul cared deeply about the church, right? And so Paul continues, that'll come up later, that Paul, Paul continues to just love the church and care for the church as well as receive care from them. That's how it's supposed to work. When we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus. Cyprus is well known, large, largest island in the northeastern part of the Mediterranean, still called that today, uh, because the winds were contrary. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, on the Asian coast, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. 
There, the centurion found an Alexandrian ship, Alexandria being a Mediterranean coastal city on the northern shores of Africa. Uh, they found that an Alexandrian ship, that you'll see in a minute, is a pretty large one, uh, on its way to Italy, sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. When we had sailed slowly through many days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus, the wind not permitting us to proceed, we sailed under the shelter of Crete. That's an island whose name should be familiar to you. That uh, Paul did some ministry there and even led many to the Lord and, and established churches. And the book of Titus in the Bible comes from the fact that Paul had left Titus on the island of Crete assigned to establish order in those churches as well as appoint elders in them. That's where you, your book of Titus comes from. Uh, the shelter of Crete off Salmone. Passing it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. That's on the island of Crete. Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous, and by the way, should point out there, much time had been spent. Guess what Paul did with that much time? He preached the gospel, established churches, ministered to those churches because Paul loved the gospel and Paul loved churches. That's a theme that recurs that we're going to come back to. Uh, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast, the fast was already over, um, the fast would be a reference to about this time of year, actually, a reference almost certainly to the Day of Atonement, which happens about this time of year and involves fasting. Uh, so you're in the fall, which means what? Winter is coming and the worst possible weather uh, making sailing on the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, almost so risky it's not worth it. You'll see that they continue to do it anyway, and that's what leads this where it is. So after the fast was already over, because it became dangerous, Paul advised them, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman and the owner of the ship than by, than by the things spoken by Paul. So here's Paul telling them, you know what? I'm just telling you, I'm sensing this is not going to go well. You know, that we're going to wreck, we're going to crash. And of course, you have the professional sailor saying he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well, we'll see how that goes. Verse 12. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter in, because sailing in the winter was not going to happen and that harbor was not good, the majority advised to set sail from there also. Indication, by the way, that the majority is not always right. In this particular case, it was not. Uh, advised to set sail from there also, if by many means they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening towards the southwest, uh, the southwest and northwest and winter there. So they wanted to get at least to the western edge of the island of Crete and then after the winter launch off from there for the rest of their journey. When the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close to Crete. So they stayed as close as they could along the coast, slowly working their way west. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Euroclidon. Not much to add about that word, except this would be a reference to a typical uh, a typical kind of weather pattern that would form that would cause great danger to shipping um, in that part of the world. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive, which is a basically a way of just saying they let her go. Um, where was it going to take us? And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. A skiff is like a smaller boat that would have been attached probably um, to the rear of this larger ship uh, and carried in tow in the water, uh, the skiff would have been the ship since the boat, the ship that they're on is so large, you'll see carries hundreds of people uh, in order to get to shore. If they're not in a harbor, they would lay anchor somewhere and they would have a smaller ship that would take whoever needed to get to shore and back. That's the skiff. So they, they were going to lose the skiff because Euroclidon was uh, rising up and uh, they wanted to save the skiff. So 
they brought it onto the boat, which would have been a very difficult task, which is what it says. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship. Now they realize trouble's coming. And fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and so were driven. To strike sail is, uh, well, it's the opposite of setting sail, right? So you've, you've used, we use that as an idiom all the time. Whenever we're going to go somewhere, we might loosely say, um, you know, I'm going to visit my family in Pennsylvania. So about 10 o'clock, I set sail for Pennsylvania, right? So set sail means to set up the sails and start on your journey. To strike the sail means to let them down, basically. All right? So now they realize there's trouble. There's a storm. They're out. They've lost control of the ship. So they lower the sails, and wherever the storm is going to take them, it's going to take them. They've wrapped the ship in cables. They've brought the skiff on board. And, oh, by the way, Paul was right. How about that? And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. So Paul was even part of that himself in Luke. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, that's a reference to the weather, bad storm, very bad storm, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Now look at this. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong. And he says it like that because most of the other people on the ship are not Jewish. So they're not only not Christian, but they have no regard for the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They have no, they're worshipers of other gods. They're worshipers of Caesar. They're worship of all the pagan gods. So an angel of the God to whom I belong uh, said to me, uh, whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, men, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So there you have what? There you have the Lord, through an angel, basically reassuring the Apostle Paul of what it was that he already told him. You're going to appear in Rome. And so Paul knows, I'm going to appear in Rome, and he tells them what should have been comforting. Yeah, we're going to lose the ship now. You should have listened to me. But uh, the Lord has told me that all of your lives are going to be spared. How's that for, how's that for a bold word of prophecy? You, know? you hear all these people today, and there are many in modern Christianity who claim to have that gift of prophecy, and mostly when they speak words that are pseudo-prophetic, they... Uh, are very ambiguous and they're usually all favorable and all for the good of the people who hear so people will like them and receive them and listen to them. But in the moments when they do happen to speak something very specific, very often what happens is you find that they're not really prophets at all because the stuff doesn't really ever happen or really come true or the prophecies are about things that aren't risky to share. Hey, here's something that Paul is sticking his neck out to share, isn't it? This ship, which is a big ship, by the way, big enough to need to tow a skiff and big enough to carry hundreds of people. This is a big ship, and Paul is telling them, you're going to lose the ship now because you didn't listen to me, but, uh, not only, but you're going to lose the ship, but you're not going to lose any of your lives. If one of them dies, they know that Paul is full of it, right? And shouldn't be listened to. So, pretty amazing. Now, when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea. So you see, they've drifted north. They were on their way to Italy, but they've drifted north a little bit. About midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land, and they took soundings and found it to be 20 fathoms. And when they had gone a little farther, they took soundings again and found it to be 15 fathoms. Soundings is when you're dipping something in the water and pulling it up to measure the depth of the water. And the point of that is, from 20 fathoms to 15 fathoms shows that the water is becoming more shallow, so they can see that they're getting closer to shore. Then, fearing lest 
we should run aground on the rocks, we dropped four anchors from, they, not we, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, so now the sailors realize, you know, we're, we're getting out of here. You know, the sailors realize they have their opportunity and they plan on just ditching everybody. They still have the skiff on board, so they're going to try to lower the skiff into the water without even noticing and get on the skiff and get away and just leave everybody else because they can't manage the big ship, but they've, they realize they're closer to shore so they can get on the skiff and they're going to take their chances that they can row to shore at least. So they're trying to escape and when they let down the skiff into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors from the prow, that's the front of the ship, they, near the front, they, they said what? Uh, Paul says to the centurion, what Paul notices, Paul sees what's going on. And Paul says, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. So then the, the commander's, uh, the centurion's decision is to make it so that nobody's getting off this ship. The fate of this ship is going to be the fate of everyone. It seems like Julius, the centurion, understands and believes what Paul is saying to him, that everyone is going to be saved because this is a drastic measure. All that work they did to pull the skiff up onto the ship, now they cut the ropes and they let it go. So that's it. Nobody's getting off this ship until it gets wrecked. But then everyone's going to be saved. So then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and let it fall, right? So you have sort of a little army-navy kind of uh, wharf, uh, uh, squ uh, squabble going on there. The sailors want to get off the ship, but the soldiers who report to the centurion say no, and they cut the skiff away. Verse 33. See, I told you this, right? It's, it's, it's a story. It's a narrative, and I'm just trying to explain the details as we go. There's, there's a few spiritual points coming to this in a minute. We've alluded to them briefly in passing. We're going to come back and camp out a little bit in a minute. And as day was about to dawn, Paul implored them all to take food, saying, Today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food. So all of them went on a two-week fast and eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take nourishment, for this is for your survival, since not a hair will fall from the head of any of you. So Paul is standing by the prophecy that he made, right? And when he had said these things, he took bread, gave thanks to God in the presence of them all, Paul always taking the opportunity to display his faith in the true and living God, right? There's an example in that. We'll come back to that in a minute too. Um, he began to eat. So Paul takes food, gives thanks, starts to eat, and that encourages everybody else. Verse 28. Uh, they were all encouraged and also took food themselves. Now, here's where you get some indication as to the size of the ship. And in all, we were 276 persons on the ship. Especially by that day's standards, that Alexandrian ship was a pretty big ship, right? So when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship and threw out the wheat into the sea. That's it. No more food now. Now they're just throwing everything away and making the ship as light and possibly navigable as possible. So here we come. You've heard of the, everyone's heard of Paul being shipwrecked on Malta. Here it comes, another Mediterranean island. When it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach onto which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors and left them in the sea uh, meanwhile, loosing the rudder ropes, so now they're not even controlling the ship at all, not even with a wheel turning the, rubber, the uh, rudder, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for the shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground. In other words, this isn't exactly where they wanted to land. Uh, so the ship basically gets stuck. The prow of the ship, we're told, gets stuck fast and remains immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the violence of the waves. Sometimes you do that. You have a little smaller boat, right? You have a rowboat on a lake or something like that, and you pull it to shore, and you can pull the front of the boat onto the shore, and it gets stopped, but if the waves continue to move around, the back of the boat might swerve back and forth. Imagine that happening to a ship that's big enough to hold 276 people. So, like, the front of the ship is stuck, 
and it's where two seas come together, which means the waves are violent, and the back of the ship is just being beaten all over the place. Right? Now, the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, Julius is a pretty wise guy here, and you know, you don't know what the eternal fate of Julius was, but you can't help but believe that Paul must have shared the gospel with him at some point because Julius realizes that, you know, Paul's got some wisdom here. The centurion, want, and, and by the way, the, this is, these soldiers are part, as I said before, of a regiment that's called the Augustan Regiment. And they have with them a prisoner, Paul, who uh, has appealed to Caesar. So you have Caesar's own soldiers bringing a prisoner for whom a whole bunch of trouble was raised up in one of Caesar's provinces in Judea, who has appealed to Caesar because he's a Roman citizen, who's being escorted then to personally appeal before Caesar. They lose Paul, or they lose these prisoners, it's their own necks. These are like, very, this is a very elite regiment of soldiers. So the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was, look at this, they all escaped safely to land. How about that? Exactly the way the Apostle Paul prophesied that it would happen. Ship destroyed, every soul saved. How about that? All right, let's stop there for a minute. And next week we'll pick it up what happens, they realize that Malta is where they land, which is still what the island is called to this day, an island itself that has an incredible history, an incredible wartime history, even in the 20th century. Maybe we'll talk about some of that next week, although primarily this isn't about a history lesson. What do you see in this? As we went through this, now, what, what sort of spiritual things have we seen? You can think of some more than I have, but there's three things here that jump out at me that I want now to share with you so you understand. I just noticed that's a different clock on the wall back there, so that one's correct, I assume, right? Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> guys are really messing with me. It's because Deacon Steve is not here. Deacon Steve is away, and so the guys just start messing with me. All right, here we go. So what do you see? Three things I want to talk to you about in the little bit of time we have left here now as we've gone over the story, covered the passage of Scripture, Number one, the life of a servant of Christ is a life that is characterized by hardship. I feel like every week, at least on Thursday night or on Sunday morning, at some point, and you would expect this doing a study of the book of Acts, right? At some point, this concept of believers and hardship, believers and tribulation, believers and difficulty, believers walking through life but not having life just being about God now, oh, I'm saved, God's just going to bless me, God doesn't want me to have any trouble in my, all the nonsense that you, listen, the life of a Christian is a life of difficulties and hardships and troubles as we've gone over before, because God is equipping and preparing us for further ministry in our lives here and is even preparing us to serve with him forever. God is raising up not just Christians. God is not just raising up disciples. God has a desire to raise up strong Christians and strong disciples and a life without hardship. A life without learning how to go through difficulties. And you fail in those hardships. And you fail in those difficulties. And you need to humble yourself. And you need to go to the Lord and go to each other and make things right in those hardships and those difficulties. And then what happens as time goes on and you grow and you become more mature, you become better at the, the going through the hardships and difficulties. And maybe you fail a little less, but you still do. But it's through this pattern of even failure and restoration and hardship and healing and everything. It's through that process that people get strong. That's how you cut some teeth. You know what I mean? A life of pleasure, a life of ease makes a person soft, makes a person unable to deal with anything when they come up. 
You know, you sometimes speak of the modern world and how it's coddled people and the modern world and how it's made people feel entitled and the modern world and how and how if the slightest little crisis comes up in somebody's life, the only thing anyone knows how to do is go to their phone and go onto some app and vent on some social media platform. Nobody knows how to deal with anything. The Lord wants us to be strong. And the way that the Lord makes us strong is he allows us to go through hardship. Listen to this. God told Paul, the Lord Jesus told Paul, you're going to go to Rome. Paul knows he's going to go to Rome. Paul gets on a ship as a prisoner to go to Rome, right? God didn't have to allow the ship to get wrecked. I mean, think of it for a minute. If God's plan is to preserve Paul and God's plan is to save all 276 people, what's the point of wrecking the ship? And you know what the answer is? I don't know. And neither do you. But God allowed this hardship and difficulty. Listen, there's all kinds of reasons you could speculate about. Maybe God just wanted to give in the sight of the soldiers, the sailors, the centurion, and all the other people on board the ship. God just wanted to show favor to Paul to like... To like uh, 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 undergird the authority of Paul as his apostle so it would open the door for Paul to be able to speak to them and share the gospel with them. God wrecked the ship for that? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, we we don't understand why God allows the trouble to begin with. But when trouble and hardship and difficulty are faithfully, prayerfully, humbly endured, and walked through what comes out on the other side is a strengthened person. And that is beneficial for yourself. And it's also beneficial in the kingdom of God. Back in chapter 14 of this book, Paul spoke to this on one occasion. If you want to look at it, you can. Chapter 14 and verse 19 Whoops, wrong book. There we go. It, it, it tells the story of when Paul was at Lystra. And he had gone from city to city and he had people persecuting him, following him wherever he went. And it says the Jews from Antioch That's Antioch and Pisidia, not Antioch and Syria, where they launched him from. You remember that story, Antioch and Pisidia? One of the greatest passages in the book of Acts. The Jews from Antioch and from Iconium came there to Lystra. uh, And having persuaded the multitudes, look, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Savage. I mean... They didn't just stone him. They followed him from their cities because they didn't like what he preached. And they they would not let it go like the ones in Jerusalem. They dragged him outside the city and they figured he's dead and they just left him there. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up, went right back into the city. That's Paul. That's the Lord working in Paul. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city in Derbe and made many disciples, they returned. They went back to Lystra. They went right back to Lystra, right back to Iconium and Antioch, which is where the ones who stoned him came from. He went right back there, strengthening the souls of the disciples. You know, you might think in human terms he would say, I don't want them to see me like this. That's what we would do. Any hardship comes into our life and what do we say? Oh, no, no, I don't want anyone to see me like this. No, no, no. Paul's like, yeah, I want them to see me like this. I want them to see what happened to me so they know what Christianity is really about. And then when he does, look, verse 22, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, now imagine, this isn't just a guy saying this. This is a guy that has marks all over his body. We must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Right? Listen. When he says we, you understand he means them. 
He stands in front of them with the scrapes and bruises and whatever else, bandages and the bloody mess that he was. Stands right in front of them and says, we must through many hardships enter the kingdom of God. He doesn't just mean himself. He's saying it to them because he means them as well. Which means he means me as well. And he means you as well. I don't cherish scrapes and bruises and physical damage to my body and but if that's what needs to come, it needs to come. But we go through hardships and trials and we look at the hardships and trials and our response is, why does God let this happen? I'm telling you why right now. The Bible says we must go through those things. That's why, because God says so. Because it's hardships that make you strong. Nobody knows how to deal with anything because nobody ever deals with anything. You don't know how to deal with anything because every time you have to deal with something, we do whatever we can to artificially suppress it. Drugs, alcohol, lies, manipulations, deceitfulness every scheme we can conjure up. When the truth of the matter is, you have an apostle who was just left laying dead somewhere, supposedly, telling the brand new Christians that he had just led to the Lord, we need to go through hardships and trials to enter the kingdom of God. Well, he's in the middle of one of those, isn't he? He's in the middle of one of those. On Malta, when Paul wrote his final letter to Timothy, uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul makes reference to what happened there in Lystra. Second Timothy 3 and verse 10, Paul tells Timothy, you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, Purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions. Look, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and Lystra. So Paul, even later, much later when writing to Timothy, still refers back to that suffering to teach Timothy with. Hardships are teachers. Embrace it. Yeah, embrace it. Embrace it. Embrace it as evidence that God loves you. We think if God loves us, he'll make money appear in my bank account. He'll make all of my troubles go away. He'll make all of my relationships. He'll make everyone like me. I won't have any difficulty with it. Smooth sailing because I walk with Jesus now. Hardships are evidence that he loves you yes. because he yes. wants you to grow. Yes. I'm not making this up. Now, this isn't my spin. This is, this is the guy who went through it and what he says about it. These are real words from a real man that a real God really used to really write down in a real book. It's all real. It's as real as it gets. Second, the second thing that I derived from this, number one, Paul points out that the life of a Christian is a life of hardship. Number two, the life of a Christian is a life of evangelism. Amen. Paul's on the ship, and Paul uses the hardship he's going through as an opportunity to speak to them of God. So I pointed it out when we were reading through. He says in the passage, he makes reference to the God that I serve, right? He says in verse 23, we're back in Acts 27, Stood by me this night an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve. And here's what he said to me, right? So Paul uses the opportunity to point people to the God that he serves. You and I, as we walk day by day, the events that come into our lives, including the hardships that come into our lives, every opportunity we get, like Halloween tomorrow. I'm not a huge fan of Halloween. I understand that Halloween and, and its like roots is not like a good thing 
and there's, there is a lot of wickedness and carnality and satanic and demonic stuff that's associated with it. We stay away from all that. I don't want anything to do with that. But you know what else I recognize is there's going to be kids walking in my neighborhood and they're going to knock on my own door. And so you know they're going to hear the gospel, right? It's an opportunity. That's what Paul does. Paul's on the ship and they all sense we made a huge mistake here. We made a big mistake. We should have stayed in Crete like Paul said. And Paul's like, yeah, you should have listened to me, but you didn't. But don't worry. An angel of the God that I serve appeared to me and said, yeah, we're going to lose the ship, but you're all going to live. And then he reaffirms it again. And then it happens. And don't you know that now, in the sight of all 275, because Paul's 276, right? So in all 275 of the other people on the ship, they know Paul is someone they need to listen to. And Paul knows that Jesus is the one that they all need. And so Paul uses it as an opportunity to share the gospel. This is what Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Uh, we went through 1 Corinthians recently, so this is sort of fresh in my mind and hopefully in some of yours as well. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.19, he says, Though I'm free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. That's what I've done. Paul, I, I'm free. I'm under bondage to nobody. I serve the Lord. He's my king. That's it. I'm under obligation to no one but the Lord, but I don't use that liberty to like tell people that. I use that liberty to willingly, gladly make myself the servant of everyone because I want to win everyone. Yeah, amen. Everything in his life was a witnessing opportunity. Amen. To the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. So Paul became to the Jews one who was like observant, like a Jew, because he wanted the door open to speak to them about Christ. When he was among people who weren't like the Jews, he would like become like them to accommodate them and go along with them, so he would have an open door. It was all about open doors for Paul. You hear, you see him refer to it in his writings. A great effective door has been opened to me. Praise the Lord. Everything for Paul was an open door to share the gospel. We have to see life like that. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, what, what do you think we are? What do you think our mission is? Everything we do, we see opportunities to share the gospel, so we grasp them. That's what Paul did. All right, and then the third thing. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read some of this passage that Bob read before. Ephesians chapter 4. The other thing, the third thing that I picked out of this passage as a spiritual principle, number one, you can see that the Christian life is a life of hardship. That's certainly there, right? Number two, you can see that Paul very much cared about opportunities to evangelize. That's certainly there. But number three, Paul certainly cares about the church. Doesn't he? It says that when Julius gave him liberty, he was free to go and come as he pleased and that he was able to receive care. Paul, and that care, undoubtedly, I'm presuming, yes, but undoubtedly that care came from the many Christians, the many believers, many of whom had come to the Lord, perhaps through his influence. Paul loved church. And look, even if you don't see it clearly in the passage of Acts I read, can you not see in the volumes of writings that appear in the New Testament that almost all are written in some way to edify the life of the church. Paul was a church guy. And when someone who's a Christian says, oh, I don't need church, I don't need to be part of a church, what are you talking about? The church is the body of Christ. We're members of one another, it says. What do you mean you don't need that? First of all, who are you to even say that? What did you create? What did you ordain? When did you speak and nothing became something? When did you tell the ocean's edge to stop here? The 
church is the body of Christ. And here's what Paul, just in one particular place, it's a little bit of a leap, but Ephesians chapter 1. Let me just read it and we'll close with this. Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Bob read the last part of this, but just listen to this. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, that ties contextually to the story that, we read to, that we're reading today, right? Yeah. When he says the prisoner of the Lord, what he means is he's actually a prisoner of Rome. When Paul survives ultimately this shipwreck and eventually makes it to Rome, where the book of Acts ends, Paul becomes a prisoner of Caesar in Rome. And he stays there for some time. And it's during that time that Paul does some of his writings, including this. So when he says the prisoner of the Lord, he's referring to the fact that, yes, I am a prisoner, but it's because of the Lord that I am a prisoner. You think I'm Caesar's prisoner, I'm the Lord's prisoner. That's what he means there. So I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech, beg you to walk worthy of the calling in which you were called. That's your call, Christian. Everything that comes after this falls under, everything that comes after this in the rest of the book of Ephesians, the next three chapters, all of it falls under the heading, walk worthy. Paul cared about the church, and Paul's message to the church was that they lived their lives worthy of their calling from God through Jesus Christ. You're called to walk worthy. Your walk matters. You should give great care to how you live. And then this teaching is all about that. Here's what a worthy walk looks like. Ready? Meditate on all these. With all lowliness, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See, unity of Spirit exists. We are one. It says that in the next passage. One baptism, one calling, one Spirit, all of this. We are one in Christ. But you have to work to keep it. You have to endeavor to maintain that unity of Spirit in the bond of peace. That's part of the worthy walk that you are called to. Look at verse 7. To each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. In other words, and he goes on to explain there, he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. In other words, the mission of the Messiah was he died, he rose from the dead, he ascended back to heaven, the Holy Spirit came to us, and all of us were given gifts. Again, church, church, church. He's telling the church, you've been given gifts and you need to use those gifts for the blessing and benefit and service of the church. Verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers for the equipping of the saints and the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, look at this, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Amen. In other words, pastor, listen, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are given by God to the church to teach the word of God to the church, which means you as the church need to very carefully listen to the teaching of the word of God. The purpose of the teaching of the word of God is to cause all of us to grow up into maturity and into unity, the standard of growth being the fullness of the stature of Christ. In other words, stature is like what you look like. So it's like, it's like, the purpose for teaching the word of God is to bring everyone to a unity that makes us look fully grown up, Jesus being our standard. Amen. Paul loves church, man, and he doesn't back down. Every now and then some well-meaning Christian will say, ah, oh, you don't need church. I cannot stand it when someone who's a Christian defames church. And I don't mean this church. I mean just church in general, the idea. Like you're above it or something. Like it needs to bow or acquiesce to you in some way if you are going to deign to go and participate in one. Who are you? 
This is all about the purpose and role of church as designed by Almighty God. And Paul loved church. That's why so many of these letters are written to it. Look, you're supposed to grow up so you don't get tricked by anyone. The world's full of deceivers, liars, schemers, manipulators, and some of them do it in the name of religion, in the name of Christ. And we're supposed to grow up, it says, in verse 14, that we're no longer... Look at... Can, can you see this? Can, can you follow this with me? Tie everything together? Paul's shipwrecked, right? And he ends up in Rome, and he still has, like, shipwreck on his mind when he writes this. You see it? You see the connection? That you, that we should no longer be children. Look, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Just like the ship that he was on was tossed to and fro and carried about by the wind to its wreck. That can happen to people. And it happens to people when they devalue church and don't listen to good teaching of the word of God. And it mars our testimony. And God is zealous for the testimony of the church in the world. Verse 17. Bob read this before. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, you should no longer walk as the rest of the world. That's what you and what is popular in this world. The world walks in the futility of its mind having its understanding darkened, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness. That's like a sexual twistedness, corruption that's prominent in the culture. That's like today. That's like now. That's the world. Teach you. Did Christ teach you that you're saved, you're going to heaven, now just go on and live your life like the rest of the world does? Paul says right here, you've not so learned Christ. You didn't learn through the teaching of the Messiah that you can just live like the rest of the world lives. You didn't learn that here. If you really have been taught by him, verse 22 says you've been called to put off your former conduct. Get rid of it. Rip it off. The old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. The same thing he said in Romans chapter 12. Right? Talked about being renewed in the spirit of your mind. We're supposed to look at things and think entirely differently. That's why you need church. (laughs) Verse 25. Put away lying. Get rid of it. No place in the life of a Christian to lie. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. We're members of one another. That's heavy. Be angry and don't sin. Let the sun go down on your wrath. We're called to settle disputes. This is a whole message all by itself. Sorry. Now, I, I, know I'm, I know even with the new clock, I'm keeping you late. But listen, yeah, you got to hear this. You are not permitted as a Christian who's been redeemed by God's grace to just walk around like not attempting to deal with differences that you have with brothers and sisters. Jesus commands us, if your brother sins against you, you go to him and you tell him your fault alone. And if he hears you, you've won him. And that's the end of it. The modern popular process of, I've been offended by something, and then just allowing yourself to remain offended, and then go to two, three, five, ten, fifteen other people, and then they go to ten other people, and spread a big situation, a wildfire that can never be put out, and then have it blow up into something irreconcilable, that's not how you learned Christ. From Christ what you learned is if there's an offense, you go to the person, and if you are the person who has come to, you're commanded to receive it. And you settle things because God cares about the testimony of the church. That's right. And he cares about you. He cares you've been offended. He cares. And if we're dealing with mature brothers and believers who love one another, then the offender cares as well as the offended cares. And Jesus says if the offender doesn't listen, then you go to him with brothers. And if they don't listen to the brothers, then you take it to the church. And if they don't listen to the church, then you treat them like they're lost and put them out. And if they repent, you receive them back. That's the process. 
But most of the squabbles and disputes should end if we obey and pursue that unity and humility and reconciliation. Because church matters. Verse 32. Verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from from you with all malice. Raise your hand if you think that doesn't mean you. Here, let's do it like this. My office will be open when we end here. And you may come in and explain, please come in and explain to me why verse 31 doesn't mean you. Persuade me. It means me. All bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor. How much? Most bitterness? Some bitterness? All bitterness. Bitterness is cancer. Bitterness is spiritual, social, emotional cancer. I don't mean to be disrespectful of cancer. I'm someone who just lost my mother to cancer, so I don't mean to be disrespectful to that. But that's the illustration that I use. It's a spiritual, emotional, social cancer. Bitterness. That's why he says it's the first thing on the list. Get rid of it. Wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. We don't have any right to evil speech. We don't have any right to evil speech. That's a, that's a big umbrella. Gossip, lying, slander. Any, any evil, you don't have any right to that. Let it be put away from you with all malice. Put it away, put it away, put it away. And instead, what? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. We depend on God's forgiveness and we won't give it to other people? What? It's all part of the worthy walk. Paul knows that the life is a life of hardship, cares about every opportunity to evangelize, and loves and cares about life in the church. That's what you see. That's what you learn. And that's Acts Acts chapter 27. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for this time together today. Thank you that we can learn from your word. Help us, Lord, to be obedient. You gave us these things that we would listen, believe, and obey. Help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only, deceiving ourselves. Thank you for your love for us. You do love us. Thank you for your patience with us. You are patient. Thank you for your grace. Your grace is abundant, immeasurable inexhaustible. Thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. Help us to learn to love one another and put others ahead of ourselves. Help us to learn to take the low road, the humble road. And be obedient to these things. Thank you for the example of your servant, Paul. I don't know why, Lord, you wanted him to go to, you wanted him to go to Rome and then cause his ship to get wrecked. But I know this, Lord, If it didn't get wrecked, we wouldn't have this story to tell and we wouldn't have this learning to do. Marvelous are all your ways, O Lord. Thank you for your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand up with me, please. We'll get, I know 345 was up there last week, too, right? That's blessed assurance. We'll get to that next week. Stand up with me. Thank you for being here today. We're going to go downstairs as soon as we break up and we're going to have some cake. Who's into cake? Nobody? Cake. Let's hear it for cake. Better yet, who wants to say happy birthday to Carlos together downstairs? How's that? That's even better. All right. So as soon as Deacon Chris closes our service with a prayer, everyone go right downstairs. Resist the urge to fellowship here. Go downstairs and we'll fellowship down there. But first, I'm going to lead us in a rousing rendition of that old song. Happy birthday, okay? That downstairs, we'll do that. Okay, so uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, the offering box is on the table in the back. I don't mean to be flippant about that, but your offerings are what underwrite the ministry of this church. Thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. You can put an offering in the box. You can scan the little thing on the wall, the QR code on the wall, and you can give online that way as well. Thank you for that. Youth group tonight at 6 o'clock. Deacon Chris, would you close us with a prayer, brother? And uh, Yes, Deacon Chris, close us with a prayer, and then we're going to go downstairs and everyone downstairs to sing. All right? Go ahead, Chris. Thank you for your word, Lord. Let's, uh, let's live it, Lord. Let's forgive those who have wronged us this week, Lord. Let's live it in the love that you've shown us, Lord. Let's show that love to others in preaching your word, in sharing your word, Lord. Let's be bold. Let us bring them to the lost, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
straight downstairs, everybody, please. Let's go. <laughs>